My entire family is thriving. Check out this review from Devin H on bone marrow and liver and skin hair and nails from Heart and Soil Supplements. Both my wife and I have been eating animal-based for seven months. With that, we ditched all the supplements and have been exclusively using heart and soil organs. My nursing wife also uses skin hair and nails, has seen a radical improvement in postpartum hair loss and milk production is on point. Our eight-month-old son's first foods have been fruit and organs. He's thriving. We empty a capsule of bone, marrow, and liver into some local banana or papaya, and he loves it. Personally, I'm on a mission to reverse autoimmune disease and winning the battle with this lifestyle, this way of eating and not eating and no social nutrition. Mahalo to the heart and soil team and Paul, who is responsible for opening my eyes to the dangers of seed oils, which was clearly the root of the problem and my autoimmune issue. Now I have radical health as a byproduct Armed with this knowledge, my family is thriving and I can't be more grateful. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo, Devin. I assume he's in Hawaii, but I'm stoked that he is thriving on some bone marrow and liver and his wife is doing well with skin, hair, and nails and his son is thriving as well and that his autoimmune disease is improved with cutting out seed oils. Check us out at heartandsoil.co.co. If you need more organs in your life, and I know most of you, if not all of you do, get them fresh or desiccated, heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical optimal health. All right, guys, on this week's podcast, and for those of you who don't know, the Kayla's Bullshit shirt is coming. We've got a new Carnivore MD website in the works. Stay tuned for that. But this week's podcast, I wanted to do Cholesterol 101. Cholesterol 101 quickly, quickly became Cholesterol 201, 301, and 401. It's just impossible to talk about cholesterol and LDL and not get complicated. But I wanted to start with some real basics and then try and lay out as simply as possible why I don't believe my, my personal elevated, quote unquote, LDL is a problem and why you might reconsider your doctor's suggestion that your elevated, quote unquote, LDL is a problem. If you are insulin sensitive, I talk about how to be insulin sensitive and I lay it all out in this podcast. So enjoy this podcast on Cholesterol 101. This is the single most asked question I get. So I wanna keep doing education on this. The feedback I've gotten in the past is that it's too complicated. I'm trying to distill it, but it's a complex issue, guys. So hopefully this is helpful to you all. If you guys want to hear from me every week, check out my website currently, which is the old version. It's a little clunky, but carnivoremd.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there and you will hear about all the podcasts and all the interesting stuff. You can follow me on Instagram at carnivoremd2.0 or that's really the place to do it. TikTok, I suppose. Obviously, YouTube, I'm there as well. So without further ado, on to the podcast. Love you all. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. This is, of course, a quote from Joseph Goebbels, a member of the Third Reich. Uh, a Nazi propaganda minister, unfortunately, said that, but it rings true today. And unfortunately, to me, it appears to ring true in nutritional science, as well as many other parts of our zeitgeist of what we believe as humans today in 2022. Today, I want to talk about cholesterol, more specifically LDL, and I want to give the 101 version, the basic introductory version of cholesterol, what it is, how it works in the body, and then I want to follow that up with why I am not afraid of my quote unquote elevated LDL. And I want to frame that whole discussion in the context of this premise that many things we have been told over and over and over. We've essentially been brainwashed or potentially brainwashed. We must be careful. There are so many things in our society, in our paradigm, our mental paradigm today, that appear to be truisms. Everyone knows that X is true, for instance. Often to me, it seems that when everyone knows that X is true, it is sometimes possibly a lie that has just been repeated over and over and over and we have come to believe it's true as humans because we've essentially been brainwashed. That is how brainwashing works. LDL is bad for you. LDL causes heart disease. I fear that this is one of those lies. Not an intentional lie, 
but an oversight on the part of the medical community, not looking at the data completely and missing the context of LDL and cholesterol that we've come to accept as true. I also believe we've come to accept the notion that red meat and cows are causing climate change as a truism. Everyone knows that's true, right? I believe this is another piece of propaganda. I'll address that in next week's podcast. This week is on cholesterol and the propaganda, the brainwashing that we have all been subject to, that it is causing atherosclerosis directly. And as I will get into later in the podcast, that requires, in my belief, it to be directly injurious to endothelium, the inner layer of your blood vessels. If the LDL particle is not injurious to the endothelium, the inner layer of your blood vessels, then how can it cause atherosclerosis? So I'll get into all of that in a moment. I wanted to start with this interesting paper, this idea that was published just in the last week or two. Eating higher levels of fish may be linked to a greater risk of melanoma. Here's the actual study from Brown University, fish intake and the risk of melanoma in the NIH AARP diet and health study. And in fact, yes, this is epidemiology, but higher total fish intake, tuna intake, and non-fried fish intake positively associated with both the risk of melanoma melanoma and melanoma in situ, which is melanoma before it actually becomes malignant or problematic. Future studies needed to investigate the potential biological mechanisms. In these commentary articles, you'll see the authors are hypothesizing about heavy metals and PCBs. If you heard last week's podcast I did, this is one of the reasons that I do not eat fish anymore, guys. If you insist on including fish in your diet, fine. It doesn't have defense chemicals. It's better than vegetables in my opinion, but this is one of the reasons that I do not eat fish. What I find interesting about this is a couple of things. First of all, this is not the first time this association has been demonstrated. Dietary polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, uh, long chain, omega-3 polyunsaturated fats, and the incidence of malignant melanoma. What do they find in this study, which is from 2017, I believe was done in Sweden, a Swedish mammography cohort. They found a direct association between dietary PCB exposure and the risk of melanoma. EPA, DHA showed to have a substantial protective association. Great, but fish is still associated with the consumption of malignant melanoma over and over. It is just a dirty food in 2022, and it was a dirty food in 2017. Now, all of the caveats apply here. Correlation is not causation. If anyone out there can come out with a come up with a better hypothesis, I'm open to it. But what we can do with this, just like we can do with red meat epidemiology studies, is generate a hypothesis and test it. I hope we will do actual interventional studies to test the connections between PCBs or heavy metals and melanoma. But in the short term, I think the most compelling hypothesis is that the fish is actually causing this, and that's a problem. This is different than meat being associated with uh, issues like cardiovascular disease or decreased lifespan, because those associations do not occur consistently in epidemiology across all populations studied. I've talked about that previously in my other videos at length. So epidemiology across the board is something to be questioned, whether it's regarding mish, mish, whether it's regarding fish and melanoma, or whether it's regarding meat and cancer. But this is so interesting. The second thing that I find interesting is that in the face of this pretty striking epidemiology, researchers, dietitians, MD, PhDs continue to say fish is a healthy food. And I've actually found in one of these articles, one of these MD, PhDs saying, we know that fish represents a healthier protein than red meat, which I thought complete bullshit, but this is how we've been brainwashed guys. We've been brainwashed so much to believe these things that it's a part of our consciousness. Eating fish has been linked to an increased risk of melanoma. That doesn't mean we should take it off the menu. What the heck? (laughs) you damn right it means you should take it off the menu. (laughs) Melanoma is a really nasty cancer. Why would you not actually just admit the fact that fish is super dangerous? Because it goes against what we've been told, and it goes against the mainstream, the actual party line, which is that red meat is bad for you. (laughs) And if you can't eat fish and you can't eat red meat, what's left? Chicken? Well, you guys heard the podcast last week. Why would you eat chicken in the first place? So this is WebMD eating lots of fish. Your melanoma risk may rise. No shit, Sherlock. So again, this is why I am not a fan of fish. And I think that these are so interesting because they also illustrate the the power of propaganda, the power of repeating a lie or a paradigm in nutrition over and over and over. We may not know it's a lie, but 
we've just come to accept red meat is bad for humans. Mm, not so convinced. And we end up in corners where there's nothing left to eat for people. I continue to believe that red meat is the most healthy food that humans can consume. And even if it raises your cholesterol, which we'll talk about in this podcast, I think it's fantastically healthy for humans. That extra cholesterol will make cell membranes. It'll make immune particles that will be beneficial in your immune response. And it'll make hormones. Those all sound like good things to me. The other truism, quote unquote, the other lie that I think has been repeated, the incomplete truth is that the sun is harmful for humans. And I came across this this week when I was doing some research for Instagram content, post-exposure persistence of nitric oxide upregulation in skin cells rated by UVA. Uh, nitric oxide is beneficial for dilatation of blood vessels, blood vessel health, all kinds of things. Up to 48 hours, you can get an increase in nitric oxide when you're exposed to UVA. I found that to be so beneficial. And this is all along the lines of the fact that a vitamin D pill is not enough. This is a topic for a future podcast, but I wanted to also share this paper before I dive in because the fact that the sun is bad for you is yet another incomplete truth, or I would say incomplete lie that has been often repeated and has been accepted as true when it is in fact something we should question deeply Benefits of UVA light on your skin cannot be replicated by a vitamin D pill, but they are real and they persist for up to 48 hours of nitric oxide. Something's beneficial for erections, blood pressure, all kinds of positive things in the human body, but we're told to stay out of the sun. Don't get that ultraviolet light on your skin. Bullshit. So let's talk about cholesterol. Let's talk about what it is, and then I'll tell you why I am not afraid of it. I wanna try and keep these podcasts shorter, it's hard when you're loquacious like I am. So let's start with this. If I search cholesterol, I see articles like this. I see a bad LDL right here. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. I see plaque in the arteries. I see high cholesterol levels. I see all of this badness, hardy, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, ruptured plaques. Again, this is what we have been told over and over and over without any context. But this is cholesterol. This is a steroid molecule and the backbone of our steroid hormones, which include testosterone and many other valuable things. So you can see here that cholesterol goes into cell membranes. Cholesterol is essential in the human body. This is cholesterol next to phospholipids in a phospholipid bilayer membrane. Cholesterol in the cell membrane is critical for proper membrane fluidity. You can imagine that if your membrane is too stiff, your cell membranes break. If your membrane is too fluid, your cell membranes fall apart. Cholesterol is essential for cell membrane fluidity, which is kept at a very, very tight level. It's a very, very tightly controlled process. Now, as an aside, very quickly, there is a theory of why cholesterol may go up on a diet that is high in saturated fat called the homeoviscous model. Many of you may ask, why does my cholesterol go up? Now, oftentimes cholesterol refers to LDL, which I'll get to in a moment, which is a low density lipoprotein, which contains cholesterol, but also contains triglycerides. I want you guys to understand first and foremost, that cholesterol is a steroid backbone molecule that is essential for human life. That is the precursor to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, androgens, mineralocorticoids, all kinds of important steroid hormones in your body that you will die instantly without. You cannot live without cholesterol. Your body makes cholesterol, something that is interrupted by statins, and your body also makes important things in that same pathway, which I will show you in a moment. Now, that cholesterol is packaged into LDL particles, lipoprotein particles, like a balloon in the liver, and I will show you that lipoprotein metabolism in a moment. This is the homeoviscous model I was mentioning, uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition from January of 2021. The homeoviscous adaptation to dietary lipids model explains controversies over saturated fat, cholesterol, and cardiovascular disease risk. If you read this abstract, what you will find, this is a long abstract, is that when we eat more saturated fat, they say corresponding with the model, we suggest alternate contributing factors to the association between elevated LDL cholesterol concentrations and ASCVD, which is atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease involving dietary factors beyond saturated fatty acids, such as an increased endotoxin load from the diet, which is coming from the gut, that is a cell membrane component of gram-negative bacteria, gut microbiome interactions, and subsequent chronic low-grade inflammation that interferes with finely tuned signaling pathways. But what they're saying with regard to the membranes here, an SFA, a saturated fat-induced raise in LDL cholesterol in healthy individuals could represent a normal rather than a pathological response. And that is because 
as the membrane becomes more enriched with saturated fat, you must put more cholesterol into the membrane to maintain its fluidity. So they'll say here, in this paper, we propose, in this paper, we propose a novel model, the homeoviscous adaptation to dietary lipids, HADL model, which explains changes in lipoprotein cholesterol as adaptive homeostatic adjustments that serve to maintain cell membrane fluidity and helps enhance optimal cell function. Due to the highly variable intake of fatty acids in humans and other omnivore species, we propose that circulating lipoproteins serve as a buffer to enable the rapid redistribution of cholesterol molecules between specific cells and tissues that is necessary with changes in dietary fat supply. Okay, so what they're saying, you eat more saturated fat, your membranes become more full of saturated fat. Saturated fat is more stiff than mono or polyunsaturated fat. This means your membranes must become enriched in something that is more fluid. And that may be a reason that your body puts more cholesterol into your cell membranes. These are phospholipids, these phospholipids have tails. If you eat more polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid, we know these get stuck in your membranes. These are more fluid. Then your body can lower cholesterol. This is the reason that I believe for decades we have been so confused by this association. People believe that cholesterol, more specifically LDL lipoprotein, which contains a cholesterol molecule, is bad for humans. So anything that lowers that must be good for us. Therefore, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which lower cholesterol, quote unquote, or more specifically LDL lipoprotein, must be good for humans. Wrong. We know that when you decrease saturated fats and you increase polyunsaturated fats, you get more oxidized LDL and you get more lipoprotein little a, things that are very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease in contrast to low density lipoprotein, something that is not strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. If you actually look at the research very well, LDL is a piss poor predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. I'll say it again, LDL, low density lipoprotein is a very crappy, shitty predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. And as I'll show you later in this podcast, when you stratify LDL versus heart disease risk by a third variable that is correlated with insulin resistance and or insulin sensitivity, you see a very different relationship emerge, whereas there's essentially no correlation between LDL level and cardiovascular disease. Mainstream medicine has it very wrong. But what we know, and this may be related to the homeobiscus model, is that when you eat more saturated fat, butter, eggs, tallow, meat, all the things that make us vital, real, strong humans, your LDL will likely go up. In the majority of the population, LDL rises. This causes consternation in so many physicians. I just had someone send me blood work today. They said, my labs look great, except my doctor's worried about my LDL. I said, don't worry about it. You are insulin sensitive, something I'll talk about in a moment, and your triglycerides are low, your HDL is high. Why do we believe LDL is a problem in the setting of insulin sensitivity? That is the main debate I have with mainstream medicine. Getting a little bit ahead of myself, let's back up. This is the cell membrane. This is an LDL particle. So this is a lipid monolayer. Again, these are phospholipids with tails that can be monounsaturated or saturated fats. You have uh, non-esterified cholesterol in the membrane and you have cholesterol ester, which is cholesterol attached to a chain, a fatty acid chain via an ester bond inside the LDL particle. And you have triglycerides like phospholipids, but not really, they have three tails as opposed to two tails but those triglyceride tails can also be composed of mono, poly, or saturated fatty acids. You'll also notice that in the membrane of an LDL molecule, which is something like a cell, but not quite like a cell because it's a lipid monolayer, you see apolipoproteins, which is just a fancy word for a protein in the cell membrane. You can get apolipoprotein C, E, and B100. Uh, there's also B48. These identify this as an apolipoprotein B containing particle. This is VLDL, so it is apolipoprotein B100. You can also get other uh, apolipoprotein B containing particles like chylomicrons and like LDL. I'll show you lipoprotein metabolism in one moment. This is another representation here. You can see LDL just has B100, IDL, apolipoprotein E, and B100, VLDL, B100, apolipoprotein E, and apolipoprotein C2. <laughs> So chylomicrons, B48, apolipoprotein C2, A1, apolipoprotein E, and HDL is over here. We'll get into that eventually. Apolipoprotein A1, E, and C2. The lipoproteins, the apolipoproteins in a lipoprotein particle identify the particle. These are like little buses running around. They go different routes. 
And you can identify the root based on the lipoproteins that are present in the particle. I know this got technical quickly. I wanted to keep it very basic. Now, classification of lipoproteins. If you repeat a lie enough times, it becomes the truth, the bad, the non-HDL. Except how can they be bad if you die without them? Chylomicron, chylomicron remnants, very big. You can see the sizes here, 100 nanometers. VLDL, 70 nanometers, IDL, 40 nanometers, LDL, 20 nanometers. And actually, it's important to note that HDL is even smaller, 10 nanometers. HDL is plenty small enough to get into the endothelium, but it doesn't cause atherosclerosis. We'll talk about why later. But HDL is even smaller than LDL. So apolipoprotein B is critical for atherosclerosis. It appears that this apolipoprotein B is the critical nature it is able that the protein B is critical for these, uh, for this particle, this LDL particle, to get pulled into the cell membrane, and that is the beginning of an atheroma, a cardiovascular plaque like one of these. But the question remains: Is LDL directly injurious to the cell membrane, or is it just an innocent bystander? In, 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 this, in essence, what I'm asking here: Is LDL the arsonist, or is it just a innocent bystander, or even a fireman that comes to the rescue of a damaged cell? Membrane. This is a good representation of lipoprotein metabolism. So we've gone from basics of cholesterol and LDL to lipoprotein metabolism quite quickly, but bear with me. You eat food, it contains fat. That fat is packaged into triglycerides in your gut, which are packaged into chylomicron particles. If you remember from this diagram, here's a chylomicron. And we know which apolipoproteins identify chylomicrons. That chylomicron is in the bloodstream. Lipoprotein lipase acts on it. You get transfer of cholesterol ester and triglycerides between a chylomicron remnant and an HDL particle via an enzyme called CETP, cholesterol ester, cholesterol ester transferase protein, transfer protein. These chylomicron remnants are taken up at the liver. Now, you also see free fatty acids going into the liver. Insulin is connected with free fatty acids. I will discuss that shortly in regard to Dunnigan familial hyperlipidystrophy. So remember that free fatty acids are connected with insulin, specifically the actions of insulin stem. They stop the flow of free fatty acids into the bloodstream. Free fatty acids can go into the liver and then the liver makes the next buses. Think of the liver as the bus station. These are buses, chylomicrons, chylomicron remnants are buses coming into a city, let's call it Chicago for lack of a better city, whatever you city you want. And there's a bus station in Chicago. There are passengers on the buses, cholesterol ester and triglycerides. They get on and off the buses. Before you even get to the bus station in Chicago, some of the passengers get off the bus and go to HDL from the chylomicron remnant and some passengers get on. But a lot of the passengers, most of the passengers get on to the big bus as you eat food and it goes to the bus station in the liver. Then the liver sends out a bus called VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. Again, we know which chylomicrons identify very low density lipoprotein. And then the VLDL moves through your bloodstream where the same things happen. CETP, cholesterol S for transfer protein, helps triglycerides and cholesterol esters move from HDL uh, to VLDL and triglycerides move um, from VLDL to HDL. And then it gets smaller and smaller because it drops things off at your cells. It drops off cholesterol for some membranes, so your cell membranes can remain as viscous and as fluid as they want to be, and it becomes smaller and smaller. You have this IDL, intermediate density of the protein, and then LDL, the one everyone thinks of and the one that we colloquially think of as cholesterol, right here, LDL. And then you have small dense LDL, and both of those, small dense LDL and LDL, return to the liver. You see the apolipoproteins here as well, E, C, A1, B100, B48. We talked about that earlier. This is a bus system. But just like buses are critical for a city, for passengers to move around a city, lipoproteins are critical for your body. You will die without these. And you will die without the cholesterol needed to make cell membranes and needed to make these cholesterol esters that go into the LDL particle and the cholesterol that is unesterified that is necessary to make these membranes and the membranes of your body, which must be fluid, okay? Now, this is a syndrome, smith lemley oppitz syndrome. This is what happens when there is a mutation in one of the enzymes 
necessary to make cholesterol. Unfortunately, these kids are born small heads, intellectual disability, behavioral problems, autism, malformations of the heart, lung, kidneys, GI tract, genitalia. They have weak muscle tone, feeding difficulties, grow more slowly. They have few second and third toes, which is called syndactyly. Some of them have polydactyly, which is extra toes. They may usually not live to adulthood. Now the causes, mutation in the DHCR gene provides instructions for making an enzyme called 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase. That is an enzyme right here at the end of the cholesterol synthesis pathway. This is a complex pathway by which you make cholesterol in your body, a substance that people will tell you is killing you. Now, perhaps the dose makes the poison, but we'll get to the fact that I don't believe that that's holding true in this case, because I think that all of these doses are within physiologic limits. And as the homeoviscous model paper says, who's to say what a pathological level of LDL or cholesterol ester contained within LDL is? That is a very important debate. Nevertheless, acetyl-CoA is condenses to form acetoacetyl-CoA. There's a number of steps here. An important one to appreciate is HMG-CoA reductase, which is this enzyme right here in green. That is inhibited by statins. So you will note that very high up in the chain of cholesterol synthesis, statins inhibit all of these reactions. The problem there is that there are many important molecules for your biology that are upstream of cholesterol. And that assumes that we believe cholesterol is a bad thing that you want to inhibit the production of. I would say, I love my cholesterol. I don't want to inhibit that production at all, which is yet another reason that I don't do things uh, that mess up my hormones or inhibit my cholesterol production. So HMG coi reductase inhibited by statins. Coenzyme Q10 is one of the critical components that is made from these downstream uh, products of mevalonate and something that is prevalent in heart. It's one of the reasons that I eat heart or I eat desiccated heart from heart and soil supplements and a number of our supplements. But 7-dehydrocholesterol is the um, enzyme, this DHCR7. This is the enzyme that is inhibited or impaired in smith lemley oppitt syndrome. And if you don't make enough cholesterol, kids are going to suffer greatly. So that is important to understand that cholesterol is critical for your body to function properly. So that is what cholesterol is, and that is what LDL is. LDL is a bus. Now, Second part of this podcast, why I don't worry about my quote unquote elevated cholesterol, which should say elevated LDL, elevated low density of a protein. Multiple reasons. Number one, becoming more specific as I enumerate them. Number one, LDL is essential for life. These kids with Smith Lemley Oppitt syndrome don't have enough LDL because they can't make enough cholesterol. What do they do for these kids? They feed them egg yolks. <laughs> they give them as much exogenous, as much food cholesterol as they possibly can in hopes that that will help remedy the body's inability to make cholesterol. They're giving them tons of egg yolks. They're giving them cholesterol and they get better. You need cholesterol to function. Why would it be bad for humans if we are otherwise healthy? Second thing, LDL has critical immune functions in the human body, which I'll show you guys a little later. It interrupts quorum sensing, which is the communication between bacteria. And we know in both animal and human experiments that if you decrease the LDL, animals get more sick. And in humans who have lower levels of LDL, they have increased rates of communicable infectious disease. So LDL is an immune particle. These are two critical features of LDL. Why would something that is essential for human life be bad for us if we are otherwise healthy? The third thing is perhaps the most important. Context is everything. Context is everything. LDL, does it directly injure the endothelium and cause atherosclerosis or is it a bystander or is it a repair mechanism that is getting pulled in? Because it, if, is, if, if it is either of the latter two cases, it could associate with cardiovascular disease in those people who are metabolically unwell, but not be causing it. And I believe that is the oversight that is being made by physicians and the medical community over and over and over. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. I've even had preeminent lipidologists debate me on Twitter, which I don't really spend much time on anymore, saying, everyone knows LDL is harmful. Who's just, you know, 99.7% of the world's lipidologists believe LDL is harmful. Who are you to say that it's not? Well, I'm a human being that is thinking about this properly and we would do well not to become dogmatic, which is to sacrifice curiosity for the sake of consistency. That is bullshit. Hopefully you guys are all still with me at this point. And the thesis that I will advance in the remainder of this podcast is that I will try to prove to you 
that LDL does not directly injure the endothelium of the blood vessels and that context is everything. The metabolic dysfunction, also known as insulin resistance, is the proximate event, the first event of atherosclerosis. And if you avoid that, if you are metabolically healthy, you can have a ton of LDL in your body and not injure your endothelium. You actually may benefit from that from cell membranes, from a hormonal perspective, and from an immunologic perspective. So at a very, very high level, let's ask this question. If LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, and I believe it must be directly injurious to the endothelium in order to cause atherosclerosis de novo from the beginning, from scratch, why do we get atherosclerosis only in arteries and not in veins when the veins are within a physiologic system of low pressure? If LDL were injurious to the endothelium, which is the same in veins and arteries, why does it not cause atherosclerosis in veins? It will cause atherosclerosis in a vein if you put that vein into an arterial circulation. But what we know is that the higher pressure of our arteries, 120 millimeters of mercury during systole, which is when the heart contracts, 80 millimeters of mercury during diastole versus much lower pressures in the veins does damage the endothelium. Aha. So what we need for atherosclerosis to begin is a damaged endothelium. And I think that is the key here. The LDL isn't damaging the endothelium or we would see de novo atherosclerosis in veins. The endothelium must be damaged for LDL to become involved in the atherosclerotic process, right? Simple. That is just something that I want you to ponder over, that you must have damaged or dysfunctional endothelium. And I think the endothelium in our arteries is always being damaged by the high pressure. But in insulin-resistant, pre-diabetic, diabetic individuals, I believe that repair process in the endothelium is broken and slowed down. And that is why those people develop atherosclerosis more aggressively than people who are not diabetic or not insulin resistant. And I would say this, in fact, I would say this very strongly. Atherosclerosis does not exist without insulin resistance. No one ever had a heart attack, not a single individual. Well, that's not true. I can't say that. But the vast majority of people who have heart attacks this is atherosclerosis-induced plaque ruptured heart attacks. Atheromas are insulin resistant, whether they know it or not. Of course, you can have a heart attack because you have a pulmonary embolus or something that isn't related to atherosclerosis. I get it. You want to nitpick me. You guys know what I'm saying. Atheroma-related atherosclerosis does not occur independent of insulin resistance, which means if you are insulin sensitive, you're fine. If your LDL goes from 120 to 180, but your fasting insulin, which is the best measure of insulin sensitivity, remains low, less than five micro IU per ml, or I would prefer it even less than three micro IU per ml. I'm going to show you guys all my blood work in a couple of weeks. Then you're insulin sensitive. How do you know you're insulin sensitive as well? Your triglycerides will be low, less than 100, probably less than 80. Your HDL will be high, probably less than 70. The one caveat there is there are people who genetically have low HDL. HDL is a complex lipoprotein. Some people seem to cycle through their HDL more quickly. That means that the HDL can be lower in people. That doesn't always mean you're insulin resistant if your HDL is low. A canonical pattern of insulin resistance is low HDL, high triglycerides. But doctors insist on getting hung up on LDL and they ignore all the other indicators of insulin sensitivity. And that to me is tragic. So let's move on to the case that I'm going to make for you guys here. If LDL causes direct injury to the endothelium, then why can I show you cases of atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? If this is truly the dose makes the poison, then why can I show you cases of atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? And conversely, why can I show you cases of elevated LDL without atherosclerosis? So consider this first. This is Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy premature atherosclerosis associated with monogenic insulin resistance. There is one gene mutated in these people, rare LMNA mutations that underlie the familial partial lipodystrophy result in insulin resistance. And hyperinsulinemia is associated with early coronary heart disease. These people have elevated free fatty acids, okay? They've elevated free fatty acids, which means this is elevated right here, which leads to insulin resistance. 
That is because they have a mutation in this gene. So they have insulin resistance, but they do not have elevated LDL cholesterol. In fact, sometimes they have low. This is the same uh, condition, elevated C-reactive protein and free fatty acids among non-diabetic carriers of a missense mutation in the gene encoding laminin A to C, LMNA with partial lipodystrophy, Dunnigan type partial lipodystrophy, LMNA mutations in non-diabetic patients with familial partial lipodystrophy associated with several metabolic and biochemical changes, particularly in women. This contributes to an increased susceptibility to coronary heart disease. So this is a condition in which people have one gene mutated. That single gene, LMNA mutation causes insulin resistance and they get atherosclerosis, but their LDL is not elevated. So if dose makes the poison, why is LDL not causing a problem here? Or how can these people get atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? Similarly, consider glycogen storage disease 1A. These patients have hyperlipidemia, but this hyperlipidemia does not impair vascular endothelial function in glycogen storage disease type 1A. So if LDL, low density lipoprotein, this particle, if that is directly injurious to the endothelium, then why do we not see a problem in these patients? If LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, why do we not see a problem when they have hyperlipidemia in GSD1A. So now we have another paper, the same thing, an association among iron, copper, and zinc, selenium, antioxidant status, and dyslipidemic pediatric patients, GSD types 1A and 3, they do not develop atherosclerosis, right? The trace elements and antioxidant enzyme levels in GSD patients failed to explain the atherosclerotic escape phenomenon reported in these patients. <laughs> It's not freaking rocket science, guys. If they're not insulin resistant, they're not going to develop atherosclerosis. Is glycogen storage disease 1A associated with atherosclerosis? No, it's not. But the medical community can't possibly wrap its head around this. And it drives lipidologists freaking bonkers because they have elevated lipids, but they don't have atherosclerosis because they don't have insulin resistance. So how can LDL be directly related to endothelial dysfunction and endothelial injury, if I can show you both of those cases. Now, familial hyperlipidemia often gets brought up, but there are also cases of people with familial hyperlipidemia, FH, who do not develop atherosclerosis late in life, such as this one, 72-year-old patient, longstanding, untreated, familial hypercholesterolemia, no coronary artery calcification, a case report, says it all, if LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, why didn't it happen in that lady? Well, probably because she wasn't insulin resistant. And that is the proximate event necessary for the formation of atherosclerosis. So why do some patients with familial hypercholesterolemia develop aggressive atherosclerosis? Well, unfortunately, some people with familial hypercholesterolemia have upregulation of LDL receptor-related proteins in their macrophages as well. So these genetic changes that result in familial hypercholesterolemia do not often only affect LDL levels. They often affect the immune cells, the macrophages, which take up the LDL and form these plaques in the cell wall. So if the mutations with FH are affecting the immune cells that are directly causing or creating atherosclerosis, then we have an imperfect system. There are many variables being modified there. FH is a very poor not a good model system for hypercholesterolemia because of these mutations and their many effects on lipid metabolism. If you are interested in further evidence that ApoB does not directly injure the endothelium, consider chimpanzees, our not so distant relatives. Chimpanzees have an apolipoprotein, which is essentially apolipoprotein B, which is essentially identical to humans. Chimpanzee serum lipoproteins, isolation, characterization, comparative aspects of the low density lipoprotein and apolipoprotein BH. It's essentially similar to humans, but heart disease is common in humans and chimpanzees, but it's caused by different pathological processes. Chimpanzees do not develop atherosclerosis despite having levels of LDL that are much higher than humans. They're around 270 milligrams per deciliter. And remember, their ApoB100 molecule looks just like humans. So why don't chimpanzees get heart attacks? 
from atherosclerosis. They get heart attacks from a uh, arrhythmia triggered by myocardial fibrosis, which is again, why I had to qualify my statement earlier about atheroma related heart attacks versus arrhythmia related heart attacks. But chimpanzees do not develop atheromas. They do not develop the thing that humans get from elevated cholesterol. So if LDL, which is essentially the same molecule in humans as it is in chimpanzees, if LDL is directly injuring the endothelium, why isn't it injuring the endothelium of chimpanzees? They don't get heart disease in the same way that humans do, and they have even more LDL than us. In fact, they have even more LDL than I do the last time I checked. So what have we covered so far? We've talked about cholesterol, what it actually is, a steroid molecule that is a precursor for hormones that are essential for optimal human biology that is packaged as cholesterol esters into an LDL, a low density lipoprotein particle. In fact, more accurately, it's packaged into a VLDL particle in the liver, which becomes IDL and then LDL in the human circulation. LDL and the triglycerides and cholesterol ester it contains are essential for optimal human life. LDL serves immune roles. I'll show you some articles discussing that in a moment. And LDL is essential for delivering that cholesterol that keeps your membranes fluid. We talked about a hypothesis called the homeoviscous model for why your cholesterol, quote unquote, more specifically your LDL may rise when you eat more saturated fat, your body must put more cholesterol into the membranes. So your LDL rises because your body is delivering more cholesterol to the membranes. That sounds adaptive rather than pathological to me. And I have shown you that there is very little, I would say no solid evidence that LDL is directly injurious to the cell membranes. And I would say there is in fact no evidence that LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, the inner layer of blood vessels. If we cannot show that LDL is injurious to the blood vessel, then what are we worried about high LDL for? What we know is that there's evidence of atherosclerosis in familial partial lipodystrophy called Dunnigan type without elevated LDL. GSD1A, glycogen storage disease 1A, have hyperlipidemia with no atherosclerosis. There's an atherosclerosis escape phenomenon. You must have insulin resistance to develop atherosclerosis. In a moment, I will show you multiple studies showing that when you stratify data regarding LDL, low density lipoprotein, and cardiovascular disease risk by any metric that looks at insulin sensitivity and or insulin resistance, you get a very different picture. This is what everyone is missing. And it drives me crazy. Furthermore, chimps have the same ApoB as humans. They have 270 milligrams per deciliter of LDL, give or take. Your doctor wants yours below 100, but chimps don't get atherosclerosis. Why not? Because they're probably not insulin resistant. They have normal physiology. Why they get myocardial fibrosis is a whole separate story that is beyond the scope of this podcast. They do not get atherosclerosis and atheromas. So there are multiple lines of evidence suggesting that LDL is not in fact injurious to the endothelium. And I would say there is no evidence suggesting that LDL is injurious to the endothelium. We talked about familial hyperlipidemia and why that is a piss poor model for hyperlipidemia because other genes involving lipid metabolism are often involved. And perhaps in a case where another gene was not involved, there's over 2000 mutations that can cause familial hyperlipidemia. I showed you a case where a 72 year old woman, I believe was uh, untreated throughout her whole life. She had heterozygous FH and had no evidence for atheroma on a coronary artery calcium score at the age of 72. If LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, why is that the case? So let's consider a few more studies like this one, New England Journal of Medicine, 1996. Hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance as an independent risk factor for ischemic heart disease. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> High fasting insulin concentrations appear to be an independent predictor of ischemic heart disease in men. Yes, we know that. <laughs> that is the main problem. Okay. Hyperinsulinemia, predictor of new cardiovascular events in Colombian patients with a first myocardial infunction. Hyperinsulinemia, predictor of new cardiovascular events in Colombian patients with a first myocardial infarction. Yup, hyperinsulinemia is a massive risk factor. Okay, this is the real important one. Low triglycerides to high density lipoprotein cholesterol. That's the ratio of low trigs, high HDL, which equals insulin sensitivity, right? and risk of ischemic heart disease. Any guesses? This is from JAMA, February, 2001. Men with conventional risk factors for IHD, 
ischemic heart disease have a low risk of ischemic heart disease if they have a low triglyceride to high HDL level. That needs to be repeated. Basically, if the men are insulin sensitive, they have a low risk of ischemic heart disease and they have other risk factors for IHD, ischemic heart disease. This is what I'm talking about. When you stratify ischemic heart disease risk by any variable, whether it's HDL, triglycerides to HDL, or it's fasting insulin, which is a study that I wish more people would do, you see that LDL becomes a piss poor predictor. ApoB containing lipoproteins is a piss poor predictor. All of these track the same. So when your doctor says, oh, we don't worry about LDL, we worry about LDLP. Well, that's just the number of LDL particles. It's the same as LDL. LDL is measured in milligrams per deciliter. LDLP is a number of particles counted by an NMR. ApoB containing lipoproteins. Well, that's chylomicrons, chylomicron remnants, VLDL, IDL, LDL, same shit as LDL, same thing. It's going to go up when you eat more saturated fat. LPPLA2, people think of that marker as a cardiovascular risk marker, but that also tracks with LDL. All of these markers are going to go up. Even most conventional assays of oxidized LDL go up because they are Boolean. They're a monoclonal antibody to oxidize phospholipids. So they can only tell you with a yes or no answer if an ox, if a, they can only tell you with a yes or no answer if an LDL particle contains an oxidized phospholipid. They don't tell you what the percentage of oxidized phospholipids on LDL is. So if you have more LDL, you're going to have more LDL particles with a few or a single oxidized phospholipids. That is normal human biology. The question is, what is the percentage or what is the number of oxidized phospholipids on ApoB? That is a test that only Boston Heart does. So really, there's only one reasonable test of oxidized LDL or oxidized ApoB particles out there, and it's not run by 99% of the labs. Oxidized LDL is a bullshit metric. So this is the problem. You can be very insulin sensitive, but your LDL goes up because you're eating more saturated fat, because of, perhaps because of the homeoviscous model. And you need more cholesterol in your cell membranes. So your LDL goes up. You feel good. Your testosterone goes up. You're more fertile. You're more libidinous. You get ripped. You're looking good. You're feeling good. You have more energy. And you go to your doctor and you say, doc, I feel the best I ever have. And they say, great, keep doing what you're doing. They look at your labs and they say, stop doing what you're doing right now. Your LDL is too high. This is a failure of our medical system, in my opinion. This is the problem with repeating an incomplete paradigm, which we might consider a lie over and over to the point that it becomes a truth. Consider this study, Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 2005, coronary calcification, coronary disease risk factors, C-reactive protein, protein, atherosclerotic cardiovascular events, the St. Francis Heart Study, found no association between LDL levels and atherosclerosis via coronary artery calcium scores. Imagine that. Like I said, LDL, piss poor predictor of cardiovascular disease risk because it doesn't reflect anything. <laughs> yes, some people who are insulin resistant will have higher LDL. And that is probably the reason we are in the mess we are in because almost everyone in the medical community and lipidologists fail to understand that the main driver, the proximate event, the first event of atherosclerosis is insulin resistance. So the question then becomes, Paul, I have diabetes. Should I worry about eating more meat? No, because the way that you reverse your insulin resistance is getting rid of seed oils and processed sugars and eating nutrient-rich foods. Meat and saturated fat are good for you. And in the process of eating them, you will get rid of your insulin resistance. Now, is it possible that an individual who is insulin resistant could eat more meat, but still eat seed oils and sugars? And that could increase their LDL, but they're insulin resistant at the same time. Yes. That is possible. In that situation, you might have a problem, but that person is eating junk food anyway. That is the standard American diet. And that is why we see correlations between meat and heart disease in the majority of the American population, because they continue to eat garbage while they're eating meat. But the meat's not causing the problem. It's acetyl oils and processed sugars making them insulin resistant. And I believe that is causing delay or problems with repair of the endothelium and therein lies the problem. Perhaps LDL is a repair molecule. Perhaps LDL is getting pulled in by macrophages that are activated. Subendothelial intima is getting expansive because of ischemia. We don't know exactly why that happens, but it's very clear to me that insulin resistance and the stickiness of the inside of those arteries is related, is the first event in atherosclerosis. If you have healthy arteries, like being in the sun, nitric oxide that I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, that is 48 hours elevated after you're in real UV light, 
That is essential for proper health of the endothelium. But you want your endothelium to be healthy. I don't care if you've got a six pack. I want you to have a six pack, but I also want you to have a healthy endothelium. How can you tell if you have a healthy endothelium? You need to know if you're insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. That is a fasting insulin. That is also an HDL to triglyceride ratio, or you could even go to your eye doctor and your eye doctor can see your arteries in the back of your eye. I've shown you guys a picture of the back of my eye. It's on my Instagram. You can see if you look closely, it's from a couple, it's probably six or eight months ago. You can see if you look closely at that photo, you can see the arteries and there's no plaque in any of the arteries. Also, I have shared with you all in the past the results of my own coronary artery calcium scan from a little over a year ago, which I'll show you now in a moment. The calcium score was zero. So that is my own personal experimentation. I'll do another calcium score soon. Uh, my LDL was as high as 500 once when I checked it, but most of the time it's around 200 or 220. It goes up and down. I don't know what caused it to be 500 that one time. Maybe it was stress. Uh, it was actually after a very, very hard workout that it went that high. So that might've been stress related, but most of the time it's in the 200s. Uh, my HDL is usually around 80 or 90 or hundred. My triglycerides are usually below 80 milligrams per deciliter. My LDL size is quite big. It's over 24 nanometers. I challenge you to find anyone else with an LDL particle that big, but my ApoB is going to be elevated, but my fasting insulin is super low, so I don't worry about it. So this is my calcium score from July 2020, so two years ago. Calcium score is zero. Zero. And I should note that I have a father with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. He had cardiovascular disease. He had an angioplasty in his 40s, so I have a primary relative with cardiovascular disease, which means that with my LDL of over 200 for 10 plus years, I should have atheroma. I don't because we don't believe the mainstream model. Presumably I have not been insulin resistant for any of that time. I don't believe I have. In fact, I think one of the reasons that it's easy for me to maintain a very, uh, I would say solid body composition is that I haven't had seed oils in many, many, many years, probably 15 plus years. So in summary, that is why I do not worry about LDL. I want to show you guys a paper or two regarding LDL and the immune system, and then I'll wrap this one up. I don't think I need to belabor this point. There's multiple uh, pieces of science that suggest this is true. Lipids a key player in the battle between host and microorganisms now increasingly recognized. Lipids and lipoproteins play an important role in host defense as part of the innate immune system. Uh, for example, lipoproteins, including HDL, chylomicrons, VLDL, and LDL, can bind to and neutralize lipopolysaccharide, lipotychoic acid, and viruses. So more LDL, more immune system? Yeah, in many ways, I would believe so. There is um, a lot of evidence that LDL interferes with quorum sensing, like I said, also, which is the communication between bacteria. So you interrupt bacteria communication, you interrupt the enemy's communication, you can defeat the enemy more easily. LDL is essential for the immune system, as are other lipoproteins. So now if you are insulin resistant, your immune system doesn't work well in the first place. So that LDL probably isn't doing anything, but this all comes down to insulin sensitivity. Perhaps in my lifetime, Western medicine will wake up to this reality. For the majority of patients that go to see doctors, an elevated LDL is a problem because they are insulin resistant. But those doctors don't even know how to reverse their insulin resistance. They don't even understand what factors in their diet might be contributing. In fact, they may even tell those patients to eat more seed oils because it lowers their LDL. This is why the whole paradigm has to change and why I do what I do. So what do you do to lower your insulin resistance? How do you fix it? It's what I always say, an animal-based diet, organs. I eat liver, I eat heart, either fresh or desiccated like we make at Heart and Soil Supplements. I eat testicle. We have that in a whole package from Heart and Soil Supplements. Get organs in your life. Add it to well-raised meat. Like you heard on the podcast last week, I don't eat chicken, fish, or pork. So it means it's beef 99% of the time. Last few days I've had lamb. They're ruminant too. They're great. Now, fruit, honey, raw dairy. Fruit and honey are my sources of carbohydrates. They're better than other vegetables, I believe, because they're less toxic. They have less defense chemicals. Talked about them multiple times on previous podcasts, and I like raw dairy. Now, I am sensitive to lactose, so if I don't ferment that raw dairy, I'll get gas, so I like to make kefir. As you heard in a previous podcast, I believe I've talked about this. Maybe I just talked about it on Instagram too. Plant fiber does not increase the microbial diversity of your gut, but fermented foods do. So plant food is bullshit. Most of it, vegetables, bullshit. Leaves, stems, roots, and seeds, bullshit. Fruit, great for humans. Fruit, sweet, colorful. Clearly plants want you to eat that. Why wouldn't you eat that? Makes more sense to me, doesn't it? So that is what I eat. If you cut out processed sugars and you cut out seed oils and you focus on beef and fruit, beef being meat and organs and fruit, you will become more insulin sensitive. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And I know a lot of you guys don't listen to the intro. 
So I want to read this review from Devin H because it's crazy. Both my wife and I have been eating an animal-based diet for seven months. With that, we ditched all the supplements, have been exclusively using hardened soil supplements, organs. My wife is nursing. She uses skin, hair, and nails, has seen a radical improvement in postpartum hair loss and milk production is on point. Our eight-month-old son's first foods have been fruit and organs. He's thriving as well. We empty a capsule of bone and liver into some local banana or papaya, and he loves it. Personally, I'm on a mission to reverse autoimmune disease, winning that battle with this lifestyle and no steel nutrition. Mahalo to the heart and soil team and Paul, who's responsible for opening my eyes to the dangers of seed oils, which were clearly the root of the problem with my autoimmune issue. And now I have radical health. As a byproduct, armed with this knowledge, my family is thriving, can't be more grateful. Mahalo, Devin, mahalo. That's so cool. But the key there is, yes, it's cool to get a plug-in for heart and soil. If you need more organs, check them out, heartandsoil.co. The key there, removing seed oils will change your life but mainstream Western medicine will tell you to eat more seed oils because they lower your LDL. Like I said, I don't worry about LDL. Hopefully this podcast is the 101 the intro podcast with some deep dives, but not too deep that help you understand why I do that. Love you guys. Kills bullshit. Later.